Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Mixed Messages with Jeff Bogue. I am Jeff Bogue. Yeah, <laughs> which yes, is you are. Odd. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your accolades. Oh, uh, I have. There's so many to account. <laughs> I, I, uh, it, they're on multiple websites, and you can come to my home office. They're plastered everywhere. Everywhere. I like to uh, show them to Heidi a lot. Yeah. So. <laughs> make make sure she's impressed with things. Um, but uh, obviously not Joe Caruso this uh, this time around. We're going to do a special episode of Mixed Messages. Um, and I actually ask uh, our young adult pastor, Josiah Bogue, uh, to come and be a part of this because I um, want to talk through a subject that is a sensitive subject. Yeah. It's a important subject. And it's a subject that has all kinds of um, uh delicacies around it. There are individual people that we want to know and love and tell about Jesus. Uh, there is this this subject cuts everywhere from like a political divide to a generational divide. And because of that, uh, it's because it's sensitive, we almost don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we don't talk about it, then we don't understand how to love each other well. We don't understand what God's Word has to say about things. We don't understand how to apply that. So the, the subject that I want to I want to talk with you about, and we want to discuss here a little bit, is just the whole idea about how, do, uh, how does the truth of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the love of the church, the love of an individual Christ follower, how does that all play out in the discussion of the uh, LGBTQ plus community? And how do, uh, how do um, they need to be understood and loved and embraced and welcomed in? Um, what does the Bible have to say? And what would Jesus have to say, not just about the, the issue of gender, sexual identity, et cetera, but about the issue of loving one another and uh, Jesus's invitation to know and to understand him. So um, it's, it's an interesting thing. We, we kind of went back and forth. We talked about doing like a sermon series mm-hmm. about this and stuff like that. And I was actually, uh, I, I was actually the one who said, let's do this in a podcast form because I think um, this is an important conversation and this kind of long format yeah. Uh, where we can investigate and understand things um, makes that conversation facilitate better as opposed to uh, like a sermon setting, which is more of a presentation mm-hmm. uh, and um, want to talk that through. So as we were talking about this, uh, I, I'll be very honest. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I'm nervous uh, to accidentally offend uh, because I say something wrong or understand something wrong I know there's a lot of definition and a lot of uh, meaning that goes into certain words and certain ways that you talk about stuff. So I'm 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 a little bit nervous to offend people in the LBGTQ plus community. I'm also nervous that people would think um, uh, we're not being true to the Word of God, and and that's part of why. I think this conversation is so important because we've we've set up these uh, polarizations that if you don't say things a certain way uh, to a certain community, um, there can be offense. And if you don't say things a certain way to another community, mm-hmm. there can be offense. And what happens is the love of Jesus gets lost in all that, and the truth of Scripture can be lost in all that. And so we want to we want to talk and and search in such a way that we're able to bring those those things together. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do is be gracious uh, to this conversation to both Josiah and myself. Uh, I'm going to ask you um, if to listen to the whole conversation. Yeah. And don't listen to ten minutes and and draw a conclusion. On uh, on uh, about any of this, hear all of it, and then I'm going to ask you to kind of um, forgive our shortcomings if if we don't say something just right or we step on a you know a, a sensitive area that is not our heart or our desire, um, and so just that graciousness of hearing it out, having an open heart and open mind. We want you to see the heart and mind of Jesus as expressed through Scripture. 
and then we want you to see um, kind of each other's heart. So this is the epitome of we want to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, or strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, yeah. and do that in grace and and truth. And that's kind of the foundation of uh, of this conversation. So, um, so I want to jump into this. The reason I asked Josiah to uh, to jump into this with me is uh, Josiah, um, you gave a message uh, maybe a year ago or so, I'm not sure now, but maybe about that yeah. time ago, uh, and you talked directly to the uh, the LBGT plus community, and I loved your heart, and I loved how uh, your your passion for that community and your commitment to God's Word, and I felt like it was very reflective of the heart and the mind of Jesus. So. I ask if you uh, would be a, a part of all this and um, and uh, help us walk through it. So I'll just kind of launch our conversation with this question. Uh, what what does uh, the Bible teach about uh, sexual identity, gender issues, and how how does God view and love each one of us? Like how yeah. would that balance play play out? Could you talk for a minute about uh, we'll start start with your heart and passion yeah. for people, and then talk to us about how the Bible intersects with all that. And Jesus intersects with it. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm with you on everything you said. I th- this whole conversation is uh, so near and dear to my heart, and I, I don't know why. It's it's th- this has always just been. I think it's because we're talking about my friends, mm-hmm. you know, and I I think. To me, this has never been a category of people. You know, it's always been like I could name names. You know, yeah. and uh, many of whom um, I might be one of the only people that even knows that this is their story. Um, and I know that I'm like this straight cisgendered, married to a woman, white dude from the suburbs. You know, and so I, I don't uh, claim to speak on behalf of uh, someone who's trans or someone who's uh, same sex attracted or whatever. But I, my heart is with them 100% with anyone in the LGBTQ plus community because I, I know that that is a community that can um, be belittled. I know that that's a community that can be made fun of, um, bullied, uh, misunderstood, overlooked, not listened to. And I know that, yes, there are people that are uh, on YouTube or on the news or whatever making statements, but most of the people in this community are caught in the crossfires of those statements. They mm-hmm. aren't those people. Um, and so <laughs> while someone might get angry or another person's like rallying and support, um, most of most of uh, people that are trans, most people that are gay are, are just trying to figure out how to be people. And um, and I and I know that uh, there's a lot of people listening to this and that that might really be your story. And and I know that um, it's, I think this is hard for some people sometimes, but like if you've met a trans person, you've met one trans person. You know, you can't take that story and map it on to thousands of people or millions yeah. of people. If you met a gay person, you met one gay person. And then if you saw something on TV, you saw something on TV, you know, and there's a danger in mapping all over that, uh, mapping that all over the place. But this is a community that represents real people and real stories, many stories in our church. Uh, I run the Young Adult Ministry at, at Grace Collective, many people in Collective, many people in our student ministries, uh, and then many people in our weekend services and all this kind of stuff. Here's what I'm, I guess, here's what I'm particularly broken about and passionate about. Um, I know that when I say to someone who is gay or trans, I can stand with 100% confidence and say, um, I am for you and Jesus is for you. Like I, I can say that 100% that Jesus wants you, that God loves you. Um, as a church, we're like here you know, for you, and I really mean that. Yeah. And I know that when I say that to whether this is you listening or, or someone in your life, um, I know that when I say that to them, it's really hard for them to believe me because it is true um, that the Bible teaches that God designed uh, romantic relationships and all sexual activity to be between a man and a woman uh, who were born that way biologically. It is true um, that uh, God created people, male and female, and he didn't make a mistake when he made people. So uh, 
it is true that you were made to live in uh, what what many would say your gender assigned at birth. Like that, it is true that the Bible teaches that. That doesn't mean stereotypes. So like, you know, like in America, we're like, yeah, men like going outside and uh, fighting each other and acting out Lord of the Rings. And <laughs> Everybody's a Viking. Everyone's a Viking and, yeah. <laughs> and girls like Barbie and pink and all that kind of stuff. And uh, God did not create those standard, uh, those right. stereotypes. Yeah, uh, right. Society created those stereotypes. It's like, and it drives me crazy when people are like, we need to get back to biblical manhood. I'm like, dude, biblical manhood was King David playing the harp. <laughs> like, yeah, that's part like, of it, yeah. You know, yeah. B- biblical womanhood was Deborah murdering a king and <laughs> dra- like putting a peg through her head, through his head. So it's like, I don't know what they're talking about when they say that. I think most people, when they say biblical manhood or biblical womanhood, they're actually talking about the earliest stages of America. That's what they're referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not what God is talking about. But it is true that the Bible teaches that God created people, male and female, male and female, he created them, and that when he made them, he did not make a mistake. Um, And those teachings have been used and sometimes abused uh, to become the center of so much pain and hardship in the lives of so many people who are attracted to a different group of people who feel like they don't belong in their own body. And so that I, I know that as long as I affirm those views that are clear in the Bible, it's very hard for you to believe that that Jesus loves you, or that I love you, or that our church loves you. Um, why, what, Josiah? Why do you think that is hard? Is it because those the truth of Scripture has been weaponized, or it's been used as a place of attack? Like, what 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 is part of why you would see that as uh, such a divide instead yeah. instead of a an invitation or a clarity? Or even a, if you disagree with what the Bible says, even a difference of opinion. Like, why has it become uh, the Bible's against us, and then the people who uh, uh, lock onto the Scripture would look and say, and those people over there are out to get it. Like, how did the conversation di- get there? Dissolve into yeah. that, yeah, where well, we can't even really share our hearts with each other anymore. Well, I I think there's many layers to it. I think one layer is definite, and a massive layer is definitely that these teachings have been used and abused as a way or an excuse to hate a certain group of people. Hmm. Like, you can't deny that. That uh, when you get on the internet, and some of the most toxic people in society live on the internet because they, (laughs) you know, have a lot of time to do that. When you get on the internet, you will very quickly find incredibly hateful things um, against people who are trans, people who are gay, people, you know, what, every one of those letters is a whole different story, but um, you'll find that really quickly. Churches have done that, Mm -hmm. you know, and churches have done that very vocally and very aggressively. You know, like in the Old Testament, um, God might say a certain action is an abomination, but people have twisted those words to say, you are an abomination. A person made in the image of God that reflects Jesus yeah. is now an abomination. Um, people have ranked sins over others or lifestyles over others. So my problem that we all understand is no big deal, but your problem, I mean, you're going, right. to, you're going to hell right. for that. And then I, even if that doesn't take place, which it, it's actually pretty rare to find someone in the LGBT community who hasn't had an explicit encounter like that, which I think is good for people to know. It's pretty rare that you talk to somebody that might be uh, gay or bisexual, trans or whatever it is, and they couldn't rattle off a story of someone who told them off, oftentimes in the name of Jesus. But even if all those situations weren't the case, I mean, imagine, imagine if someone just told you, essentially, uh, when you're young, you will never be able to have sex with anyone that you're attracted to ever. And if you do that, you're not following God. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty aggressive thing to say. Yeah. Um, and then I, it, and it's like, you start thinking about that and you're like, man, I don't, if someone told, you know, we can't even control, many people can't control the pornography addictions, masturbation addictions. Um, their lust for other people. And it's like, and now you're just throwing this onto this other person who's attracted just as strongly 
to a different group of people. Um, and most of them uh, are, that's not, you know, there's a lot of people that are very loud and proud about that, but most people that I talk to, that's something that they keep a secret, but they're being told and they don't know what God thinks of them and they don't know if God hates them, blah, 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 blah. And then if you tell somebody, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to people who are trans, they'll describe a very prolonged period of time where they had intrusive thoughts, often when they were young, often when they were teenagers, when they had intrusive thoughts every day, sometimes hours a day, that I am in the wrong body and when I was made, someone made a mistake. Um, and it, it's not like one day they're just like, and I'm gonna transition. It's like transitioning is a absolute last resort for mm. the vast majority uh, of, of people in that scenario. But it's like, if you woke up every day with a thought to have a, to act in a certain way or live out a certain way, most of us wouldn't last five days yeah. before we live that thing out. And now we're talking to people who have had these thoughts for years, years, um, and they know the consequences of it. They know that like if someone had a, a gender transitioning surgery, that those are irreversible, you know, the physical um, ramifications of that. But then the social ramifications are much worse because you know that um, almost certainly someone in your family or some people in your life are going to reject you and never talk to you again, but you just want the thought to go away and you just want to feel comfortable in your own skin. But it's like when you start thinking about it like that, it's like, wait a second, we're doing stuff like this all the time. Every outburst of anger I've ever had is because for like 20 minutes, I had an intrusive thought, this is my wife's fault and I would feel better if I told yeah. her off about it, you know? You map that out for five, six years, you know? And so you start talking about the damage of someone who is already terrified, already afraid, already worried of being rejected. And then when they um, make certain decisions that people oftentimes in the name of God do everything they're afraid of, sometimes 10 times more than they thought it yeah. was gonna be done. I, I, think this is a, I, I think this is a huge part of my heart because the, the, what, what I've seen happen um, it's it's a really interesting thing, you know. I you uh, I am 27 years older than you are. I know that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it there is a generational divide, mm -hmm. and so for uh, a guy my age or my generation that did not uh, grow up with complete access to pornography, did not grow up with a, a media that would would give. Uh, that would normalize behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the way that I think about uh, these issues is different than why, w the way that you would think about these issues because um, there's a different exposure. And then like, it, like you said, like these are my friends. Like a, I grew up with people who had these thoughts, yeah. struggled with these thoughts, tried to follow Jesus, are overwhelmed by these things, et cetera, et cetera. So I, th I think this is what where my heart beats a lot. Um, where my heart aches is that the response oftentimes, like when you said to the LGBTQ plus community, when you said, like, I know that you hear it this way, my heart aches because the Bible does say, and the Bible does draw clear lines, and the Bible is not in, uh, you know, it's not ambiguous about things. It's not ambiguous about a lot of things. A lot of things, right? But but the reaction, which is a lack of understanding, sometimes a fear, the reaction is to take what the Bible says and condemn, right? And then that's the only part of the scripture that is amplified. Right, Because right. the Bible has a lot to say about, let, let's, you know, the, 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 a lot of times people in the, in, uh, in, with those struggles are labeled and shouted out as sinners. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about sinners. And the most thing that the Bible will often say is that they are loved by Christ and yeah. that he came to redeem and call. So a part of the scripture is being amplified, and then a part of the scripture is being muted. And um, it to me, it's heartbreaking because there's there's a whole story, 
And I like to say, I say this a lot, if you can stereotype a person, you can then you can categorize them. If you can categorize them, you can dehumanize yeah. them. And if you dehumanize them, then you can release yourself of responsibility. Those people over there. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, well, but this is a this is a hurting, maybe lonely, like you said, like they're bearing a burden, an intrusive thought. And to be, Jesus would never abandon that person. He would run to that person and and he would engage with the whole of them. And for some reason, it's a little strange to me, um, but for some reason, the stereotype of the people of God is to abandon yeah. and to condemn and even shun instead of seeing someone who needs Christ maybe has pain in their life, maybe has, you know, who knows, or they're, they're wrestling with a, a burden and not enter into that relationship to, um, to bear that burden and bring the hope of Jesus to it. And that, I, I get it because um, I think a lot, of, a lot of this conversation has been politicized. Right. And so it's, we're at political points of views, but I would just remind those of you who are Christ followers Politics does not drive our faith. No, our faith no. defines politics. So, where where we should be above these canned answers and campy, I'm in this camp, I'm in that camp, and it's it's expressing grace and truth yeah. through the love of Jesus Christ and telling the whole story of who Christ is and how He would look at anybody who struggles with any thing. Well, I, I, I definitely sense that because when you're talking about um, what are the layers that cause a miscommunication, I think if we were to add another layer and probably a big layer is there's a fearfulness of maybe people that are more, um, that are maybe more uh, socially conservative, that this group of people is going to maybe ruin the country or ruin society. And I think sometimes that essentially American fearfulness gets spiritualized. And now you're, um, you're afraid of the implications of what legislation might be, free speech might be. You know, it, it's been a lot of my conversations recently with people. And that has turned now into a borderline hatred of a group of people. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and what I'm trying to say is, the, the first of all, what you just said, um, we're building the kingdom of God. We're not here to save country, as you say all the time. Yeah. Sec second of all, um, even if we did uh, lock down in the United States of America and we're like, this is our home, which would uh, be an equal sin to any of the things we're talking about so far. But even if we did do something like that, most of the people that we're talking about are not the people that are threatening those things. Yeah, th this is huge. And, and I would, I would say, to everyone who's listening, I, I think I think a part of this is we respond to the activists yes. instead of the individual. So there's there's activists who are like every it should be Pride Month and every and we react to them. There's also activists that are saying the Ten Commandments should be posted in every classroom. And what happens is those who are cheering for Pride Month the other side now pushes against that. Right. Those who are cheering for the Ten Commandments, the other side now pushes against that. And what I'm trying to say as a Christ follower, um, I'm I'm not in I'm not even in that fight. Right. I, right. I'm looking at an individual saying, "Wait a minute. Uh, this this is what the Scripture says. That that is, uh, and here at Grace Church, that's a closed matter. Right. Like this is what the Scripture says. Closed matter." How do I bring the truth and the grace of Jesus, which is a part of his truth, to an individual? The activist probably isn't even going to have a conversation with me. The other activist isn't going to have a conversation either. That's not who's in the room 99% right. of the time. Right. It's a person who is... Um, who is struggling uh, and a person who 
it has a if they're in the room and in the like the sphere so to say of of the gospel there's an interest right for sure there's an if, openness yeah if there was no openness they would they're not going to listen to this conversation right <laughs> <laughs> you know so so like as individual Christ followers and as a as a as a church congregation who's kind of on the ground so to say that is the predominant thing that should drive us. Yeah, absolutely. When we're, when we're well, interacting I, with folks, I, I challenge I challenge people, um, my own age and younger, all the time. Of because when someone when someone comes into collective or at our church for the first time, um, very high chance they didn't grow up in church. But what's unique about America is uh, we're not a church culture; we're a post church culture. Yeah, and so. Even though most of the people coming in or many of the people coming in have never been to a church, they already have a preformed they have an opinion. A, opinion about yeah. what Christians say. And so I challenge my own generation all the time of, hey, how much of your view of Christians, the church, but especially Jesus, is just formed by things you've heard, things you've heard on social media, things you've seen on the news? things you've heard from your crazy uncle, you know? And if you were to just remove those examples, how much of an opinion of Jesus would you still have? Well, most of the time they wouldn't have any. Well, I think a very similar, that's that, so everybody, hopefully anyone hearing this is hearing that challenge. But I think there's also a very similar challenge for the person that um, might be naturally offended by the LGBT community of just asking, okay, how much of your view of this community is formed by social media, the news, activists, activists, um, or extreme examples versus personal relationships that you actually have. And most of the time, I think a lot of people would say, I actually don't have a meaningful personal relationship with anyone in this community. And so no wonder my, you know, Zuckerberg did it to you. You know, no, no, <laughs> no wonder your brain is filled with like more of an algorithm yeah. than, than yeah. A, a person. Yeah, it's 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 an absolutely fascinating thing, and and it's interesting. We we talked uh, um, when we were you know getting ready to do this. Uh, we talked a lot about John chapter eight, yeah. the woman caught in, in adultery, and the Pharisees. So if you don't know the story, the Pharisees uh, catch a woman in adultery. They drag her before Jesus th th to trap Jesus. Right. They don't and, grab the man. They don't grab the man. Just the, just, just the, the woman. woman. And they throw her before Jesus. And it's interesting, they had an algorithm. Yeah. It was called the law. Yep. And under the law, the woman, somehow the man didn't have consequences, but the the woman caught in adultery was eligible for capital punishment, mm -hmm. right? So they throw her before Jesus and, and uh, they're all kind of standing in a circle around her. And it's interesting what Jesus does, that there's all kinds of accusations. Don't you know that she's like this? Don't you know how women are? Don't you know how adulterers are? Don't you know how prostitutes are? Don't you know all of these stereotypes, all of these algorithms? The Bible says that Jesus bends down and starts to write something in the dust. Doesn't tell us what. Uh, Pastor Bob uh, Combs always said he his theory was possibly it was the guy's name and their sin. <laughs> That's <laughs> so funny. Habakkuk, you did, you know, yeah. Jesus knowing all that kind of things. But we don't know. You know, yeah. it's it's a it's an interesting thing to speculate about. But as Jesus was writing in the dust, the crowd shut up. And as they shut up, and the, the Bible says they started to kind of drift away, because Jesus. Whatever he did, he rehumanized an individual. Yeah. She went from a woman caught in adultery to a human being created in the image of God, loved by God, that Jesus was actually on the planet to die for. And it was fascinating. Um, when he does that, he, he does a couple of things. He, he looks at those guys and he says, you without you without sin, you cast the first stone, and and you had and nobody cast a stone, no right? Because they would have stoned her to death. That that was an ancient practice that they would literally throw rocks at someone till they killed them. That's what it meant to be stoned to death. And Jesus, like if you, if you're without sin, you do it. 
and they all walked away. And, and it, it's interesting. I feel like when it comes to LGBTQ plus stuff, we have elevated a sin and we've elevated a temptation above others. Because when we'll, we'll bust out verses like in, uh, in Corinthians where yeah. the, the Bible says, you know, homosexual offenders won't receive the, the, the uh, kingdom of God. It also says thieves. It also says those in witchcraft. It also says adulterers. There's a long list. Well, and the, and the group of people God is the most aggressive with are the pastors, uh, the church leaders of Jesus' day that supported the hatred and ostracization, that's a crazy word, of people that were sinners. That's right. And so the, Jesus pointed that hypocrisy out to those leaders. He says, he says now wait a minute. If we're going to look at her sin, let's look at yours. And and a different part of the scripture, he's like, by the way, if you ever look lustfully at a woman, you committed adultery. Right. So you also should get stoned to death. And he he doesn't equalize the uh, playing field of saying you sin too. What he equalized was you need as much mercy and grace and forgiveness as she does. Right. He it's the rest of the story of his story that he brought out. So they they drift away. And then it's interesting, he looks at this um he looks at this lady as they walked away and he the he, the Bible says he stood up and he said to the woman, "Where are your accusers?" And then he says, "Don't even one of them uh didn't even one of them condemn you?" No, Lord, she said. And they, then he said, "Neither do I condemn you, condemn you." And then he said, "Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. his, his compassion and his mercy and his defense was not him walking away from what was right and what was wrong or what was true or untrue. And th the way that I like to think of it is this. I, I was raised a little bit in a, in a legalistic setting. You were raised in a perfect setting. I can't think of a better example. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was raised in a legalistic setting. And what I like to say is I was always told half the story. I was told of God's holiness, his justice. I was told of my sin, my failure. I was told of ways that I was not serving the Lord correctly. I was, I was told half the story. And that half of the story is correct. Right, it is. I was never told the other half of the story, which is equally correct. Mm -hmm. That God is full of mercy, he's rich in his grace, he's abundant in that. Uh, he forgives me freely, he forgives me. My heart is washed whiter than snow. I am a new creation. I do not live under condemnation. God never excused my sin and me living life away from him. He invited me into forgiveness right. and mercy. And I, I think that's where my heart breaks a lot is I'm like my savior who saved me. Like there's, <clears throat> there's a whole story to him. And part of it is my sin. Yeah. You know, that you don't... You, when we when we don't admit that, then we're omitting another part of his story. Jesus didn't need to die for us to be good. He needed to die for us to be alive, right? So part of it is my sin. But then the the wonder of uh, is his grace and his mercy. And for some reason, that message has been separated. Mm -hmm. And so it breaks my heart, and it's been separated, and it's been hurled yeah. at certain groups of people, and it breaks my heart that they've been pummeled with half of the story instead of having the rest of the story. The Bible uses the word lavished, lavished with the rest of the story, neither one of those have should be omitted. Right. But we, the stereotype of the church is that half of it's been omit, omitted, and it's not the sin part. 
No. It's the grace and forgiveness part. <laughs> no. That's been that's been omitted. And so people people have trouble seeing the real well, Jesus. And what's so interesting about all that too is like it seems the devil lies in a few different ways. One of them is to twist the truth. So you take something that is true. Very rarely does the devil just say the opposite of what's true. Yeah. Normally he says the truth slightly wrong. That's a bad lie. Right. You always hor- get caught in it's that It's a lie. horrible lie to be like, you're wearing a red shirt. And it's like, <laughs> well, obviously not. Um, you're colorblind, though. You're wearing a green shirt. You know, it's like, that's, a little, that's a little closer. So one of the ways the devil lies is to twist the truth. The other way he lies is to tell a half-truth. And anyone that's talking about sin and the punishment for sin, blah, 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 without talking about, and anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, is in their own way telling a lie. Vice versa is true. But it's interesting in that story uh, with the woman caught having the affair that a lot of a, a lot of us in our minds, what we think is going to happen is, or how we think God interacts with us is first, you got to get rid of your sin or whatever, you know, call it whatever you want. You got to get rid of your own toxic traits. Once you get rid of your sin, then God will forgive you. And then once you're forgiven, then God will save you. Yeah. What's really interesting in the John 8 story is that the first thing Jesus does is save the woman. She's about to get pummeled. Like they're going to throw rocks at her until she dies. The first thing Jesus does is go, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? So he saves her first. Then he forgives her. He says, neither do I condemn you. And after he's rescued her, revealed his heart to her, then he reaches out her hand, his hand and say, uh, go and sin no more, come follow me. Yeah. Um, and it's so interesting. I don't understand what our expectations are all the time because um, we can't get past our pornography, hypocrisies, anger, jealousy, gossip. Mater- yeah. Without the Holy Spirit entering your heart first, rewiring your heart, and then changing your lifestyle. But for some reason, if somebody does something we don't like, we expect them to clean that up first. Yeah. As uh, my good friend Vinny LaBelle loves to say, uh, we expect a lot of people to clean themselves up before they get in the shower. And it's like, that's just not the point. Um, and so what Jesus is trying to do, you know, over and over and over in the Bible, it says that Jesus went after two groups of people. And it's so interesting how often it repeats these, these two groups of people. He goes after the tax collectors and he goes after the prostitutes. And if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just circle every time it says tax collector or prostitute. Um, And it's like, why are these four biography writers saying this over and over? Because he went after other kinds of sinners too. Why these two? Well, these two in the Jewish society were the most extreme examples that the Jews could imagine of how far you could be from God. And it offended both sides. So... Uh, the, the tax collectors were the oppressors. They were Jews that betrayed the Jewish society, joined the racially abusive Roman government to start oppressing the Jews. Um, and so basically their equivalent of the liberals, the liberators, hated them. Uh, it would not be dissimilar to how um, many of us feel about uh, police brutality or like racist cops or something. It's like, you're supposed to protect us, those are the tax collectors, and, and you know the equivalent of the liberals hated them. The prostitutes um, were who the religious conservatives generally hated. They were, you cannot, you, you know, we're talking right now about how people get offended about sexual things. 2,000 years ago, man, just multiply it by 20. Like they're going to literally yeah, kill. Yeah, we're also, we're actually pretty moderate. They're going to kill, <laughs> they're going to kill these, these women and, and men, but women. So the religious conservatives hate the prostitutes. Well, the way that the crowd is reacting to that woman or the prostitutes of the day is very similar to how the extreme religious conservatives of our day would react to the LGBT community. So basically what I'm saying is Jesus went after the tax collectors and the prostitutes. If he was walking around right now, one of the first groups of people he'd walk up to is anyone in the LGBT community one for their sake, of course for their sake, predominantly for their sake, but also for our sake to show yeah. there is no one off limits here. And Jesus was constantly putting himself into the most controversial of situations. One of the reasons that the Bible makes very clear that they ended up crucifying Jesus was because of his reputation of the people that he hung out with. 
he spent so much time with prostitutes and tax collectors, he got socially lumped in with them. And that was part of the stated reason the He'd Pharisees have, are like, we're going to kill him. The, the, I love the quotes that uh, he would have dinner with notorious sinners. Notorious sinners. Yeah, it's one of my favorite quotes. And it's like, we want to think these guys are like cleaned up people. It's like, no, these guys are scary. Well, one of the one of the titles of Jesus was he's a friend of sinner and, and sinners and many times as Christ followers we think that's he's my friend, but like sinners is a really broad category. It's very broad. And and when you're talking about tax collectors and and prostitutes, it's the people we would tend to defriend. If you just think about right now, if you just think about the person that you can't stand the most, that you avoid the most, that you get the most angry with. Well, there's a very real thought experiment of how would I feel if Jesus came back right now and just immediately went to dinner with that person? Well, no wonder the Jews are all mad. Yeah, You know, he, he's finding the people that are most hated, left and right, religious, secular, whatever, everyone. And he's hanging out with them because he he equalizes everybody. And then when he says to the crowd with the, the fair situation when he says to the crowd whoever is without sin throw the first stone well was there no one in the crowd without sin there was one person there yeah, without sin that's right there was one person and he said i don't condemn you. and he says i don't condemn you and so if god is looking at people and saying i love them i want them i came for them who am i to say anything less than that because i i'm the person that jesus came for too the it, in that uh category it's interesting who Jesus called. So when Jesus called his 12 disciples, he kind of called a cross-section of the culture and the community. A pretty aggressive cross-section. Pretty aggressive because another, another type of person that he called was Simon the Zealot. The Zealot. He, Simon was an activist. And he, he, he was an aggressive activist. He was a violent activist. Uh, borderline Jewish terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, so Jesus looks at the sinner and the Pharisee and says, you come to me. And he looks at the activist that would be the activist on the right or the activist on the left and says, you come to me. Mm -hmm. he, he is the focal point of all of it. And when he forgives sin, uh, he, he's saying when you repent, the word repent just means to turn around. Yep. When you turn around and you repent of your sin, he looked at the lady and he said, go and sin no more and follow me. I feel like what we say a lot of times to people who struggle with, uh, with gender identity, you know, trans, gay, whatever, I feel, like we, I feel like Christians sometimes say to them, go and sin no more. Right, that's it. And, and I, you don't put yourself on the line to protect them. And, and you don't put yourself on the line to lead them toward Christ. Right. So you're saying empty your life, but you never show or or lead to anything to fill your life with. Right. And and that's that is um, that one's on us. That one's on us, because when we go and make disciples, that's what that is. I'm going to walk through life with you. I'm going to befriend you, as the Holy Spirit convicts you and and deals with. The, the places in your life that don't align with God, it is the mature believer, so to say, that helps you fill your life and show you how your life, not just, not your behavior, but how your life is defined right. and filled by, by the person. Well, and, and for anybody that is listening who follows Jesus, I, I just want to, I have to remind myself all the time how long it took for certain behaviors yep. to change in my life and for certain, um, for me to understand certain things. I don't think I really had my head wrapped around the gospel until after college when I had already worked at a church for four years. And got a Bible degree. And had a, I had the Bible degree, you know. Um, You're an ordained pastor. <laughs> right. Yeah. I like, and, and so, and then, then you talk about um, in the way I talked about other people or habits or temptations or, you know, it's like, and I, th I think sometimes if we're particularly offended by something, we expect it to be gone tomorrow. And what the Bible teaches over and over again, Jesus teaches it, the entire book of Galatians is about this. 
is it's not works before faith. It's faith or love for Jesus. It's love for Jesus, and then you obey. And so what we're putting in front of people and trying to put in front of people um, we're, is not, here's the list of things you need to do. Right. We're not shying away from that. I'm not being unclear about it. What we're putting in front of people is, here is who Jesus is. Decide who he is first. Invite the Holy Spirit into your heart. And from that point forward, you will slowly and gradually become more and more and more like him. It, and when you read Paul's writings especially, so Paul really helps us to work out our yeah. faith in Jesus, right? So he writes to the early church, and it's fascinating what he what he says. He's like, hey, hey, church, quit having orgies. Yeah. Hey, church, quit practicing witchcraft. Hey, stop, church. Stop, stop uh, hooking up with temple prostitutes. Yeah. Don't sleep with your mother in law. <laughs> yeah. These these are actual directives in the scripture. In the church. These are not fringe people. This is the church itself. And th- this is, it is a, a, a rewiring. Yeah. It is what the Bible would call a renewal of the mind. The, the, uh, the um, willingness of somebody to be discipled was was not determined by what they already knew. It was determined by their their responsiveness to what they just learned. Yes. So there were a lot of like, oh, yeah, don't be drunk on much wine. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. yeah, just be controlled by the Holy Spirit. All right, you know, and then and then figuring that out, and for for anybody that was not raised in the church was not raised in a culture that reflected Christian values or morals, this way of thinking is a completely new thing. Very Ma- new. Many people who, um, uh, in, in your generation uniquely, but in all generations, that some of us might be looked to say, they're, they're rebelling against God. Well, we all do in our heart. The Bible's clear about that. But when you think about that in a cognitive way, what we tend to think is they know what God says and they're spitting in his face. And what we would say is they don't know what God says. Yes. They're not, they're not cognitively rebelling against God. They're, they're going down paths that make sense, that might be celebrated by a culture in some ways. Right. And they're looking for something that we found in Christ the the response is not to push them further away and accuse them. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this, and he, he says, what business is of it is mine of, of what outsiders do? I, I, it, it's, I, if you're a Christ follower, it's a very different conversation because totally. you have to learn. But we when we position ourselves as they should know better, well, they don't know better. Right. And they also don't know of the love of Christ, and they don't know of the truth of Christ, and that affects the way that they live and the decisions that people would make. I remember having a conversation with um, someone who was who was in his seventies, and I was uh, we were talking about collective, and we were talking about um, all the people who are accepting Jesus at our church, who are young adults, who just weren't raised with any of this, and. Uh, this man loves Jesus and, w- and was asking about um, the people who are gay and the people who are trans were accepting Jesus. And he was basically asking how quickly uh, they, they're they pivoting, you know, certain things in their lifestyle. And, and some people it is immediate, you know, some people it is everything all at once. And then other people is, it's one step at a time. Um, but I, I was trying to explain to him, I'm, and, and so in Romans chapter one is one of the passages in the Bible that often gets used to talk about uh, homosexuality specifically, because Romans chapter one describes a group of people who, it, Paul's words, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Yeah. And they go so many layers deep into exchanging the truth about God for a lie that they continue to abandon God and eventually that leads them to um, same-sex practices and probably like aggressive and maybe even abusive same-sex practices. Um, and so sometimes Christians will look at Romans chapter one and say, see, that's what you know people who are gay are like. And there's only one problem with that is the phrase, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. You have to have the truth about God to exchange, to it. exchange it for a lie. Now that I'm not saying we don't know things 
written deeply in our hearts. That's right. The law but, is written on our heart. Yeah, but that's not what it's describing. It's yeah. it's talking about people that like knew, knew. And so I said to this man I was talking to, as I said, the people in Romans chapter one aren't normally the people in my generation. Normally that's their parents or grandparents who at some point, maybe they even knew the Bible. Maybe they even knew what it says. In a few generations back, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. But these guys that would be more so my age or younger, oftentimes have been raised from day one in the quote unquote lie. They don't know any other thing. And so part of the reason we're seeing so many people in this community accept Jesus is because it's their first exposure to the truth. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember very specifically, even in the last retreat, uh, at least three people that I know um, were uh, coming forward to receive Jesus. And so many conversations, and you're, you're talking about undoing like 27 years of life. And then if somebody's older, you're talking about undoing 50 years. Like this, this is a challenging overhaul. Yep. Um, but it's just good to know that, you know, some of us were raised in really great families, even if we never accepted Jesus, our worldview and lifestyle would be in the ballpark of the at least the morality systems yeah. of the Bible. That's not the case for a lot of the people that we're talking about. And then if you add any kind of parental abuse, any kind of ostracization, any kind of, you know, man, you start to build compassion yeah, really it, fast. It's a, it's a fascinating thing because the... <sighs> If, if you did not have parents or grandparents that knew and followed Jesus genuinely. Genuinely. Um, and you did not grow up in church, which the, uh, the rule of thumb is that only 18% of 18-year-olds grew up in church. 75% of 75-year-olds grew up in church. That's the old rule of thumb. So right. somewhere in there, it's a big drop-off, right? And of that 18%, who knows what quality, what frequency, that, what, you know. Bingo. So it's very, very low, the number of people who grew up in church. Okay, so just do this math with me, everybody. If I don't have a family that reinforces uh, Jesus' truth and love, and I don't have a church that reinforces Jesus' truth and love, where in culture would I find that? It's, it's not on the internet, it's not in a movie, there's no Andy Griffith show, there, there's, there's no uh, truth, justice in the American way, there's not Superman. So all of that is gone, which means I have no exposure to that at all. So when you look at me and say, you're, you're, a, you're a sicko, you're a pervert, they would look at you and say, what are you talking about? I, what am I doing? I, I love someone. I, I am attracted to someone. You're rebelling against God. What are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. And, and this is where my heart breaks. You're, we, we throw scripture at people who don't have a context to understand. No. What, what we're talking about, and it pushes them further away from what they need. Now, when you reverse that flow, because we're seeing revival in uh, youth ministry, collective, even in, even in uh, the adult world, all over Grace Church, because when you're exposed to the gospel, it fills up so many voids in your life so quick. Right. And, and it's, it's a – the gospel is um, – it awakens you is one of the ways that the Bible would describe it. it. And when you see that, see people respond to that, they have never encountered it before and didn't really even know that it existed. And you, it's a powerful thing to see the life transformation. Well, once that faith or Jesus is accepted, now you're into Paul saying, okay, now... Don't get drunk on much wine. Like, right. Don't sleep with your mother-in-law. Like you, you, it's it's instruction, and the people who truly have received the gospel are open to that instruction. It doesn't mean that ruling out that old way of life is easy. Right. That's why Paul says Romans seven is like I, I wish I didn't do the things that I do, but I do, and I can't, and I'm warring against my sin nature, and that's what all of that is tied to. Um, but now the Holy Spirit is making something make sense, and they're hearing it 
for the first time. There, there was a there's a buddy of mine, just accepted Jesus. I think he's like sixty seven, and uh, he just accepted Christ. And I baptized him in a in a, a service. And it's fun to teach him the Bible because he's like, what? Yeah, you know, it's the best. And then he's in he's in a Bible study, and and like he'll raise his hand. It's funny. Couple guys that grew up in the church will be philosophizing back and forth. He'll raise his hand and he's like, "Aren't we just supposed to do what it says?" That's awesome. <laughs> you know, that is awesome. And, and it's like he he's awakening to this, and um, and it's fun, and it should be kind of our our heartbeat toward toward each other. When uh, when you think about um, kind of this and and. Uh, uh, where this heads, Josiah? Like, wh- what? What is? What is your heartbeat? If you were gonna s- express your heartbeat and Jesus's heartbeat to someone who's in the LBGQ plus community, and maybe express a heartbeat out of someone who is like, but I really, really value the Word of God, and I don't yeah. want to lose those things. What? What might you say to them in, in all of that? I think first off, I'd say um, if you're listening to this and you'd identify as LGBT anywhere in there, um, Jesus is running after you, man. I mean, if you think even for a second that Jesus isn't obsessing every day about getting a hold of you, that your Father in Heaven isn't crying, Mm. you know, isn't crying every day to bring his, his lost kid home. Uh, you're wrong, I, and I'm I'm sorry. I just want to apologize for anyone who has lied to you or told you something different than that. Um, but you are the person that Jesus came for, uh, and I'm so confident. I'm so confident that if Jesus was walking around right now, he'd just beeline right to you. Uh, for followers of Jesus, m- maybe that are trying to wrestle all this with the Bible and and all that. I, I think it's important in John 8 to recognize the trap that the Pharisees set is a really interesting trap because the Pharisees come with this woman caught in having an affair and they say, Jesus, the law of Moses, which was the Jewish Bible at the time, we don't follow the law of Moses anymore, but they did, and it was from God. The law of Moses says that the penalty for having an affair is capital punishment. What do you say? And so when the, when the Pharisees are saying this, they're not stretching the Bible to make it say that, you know, it, it actually does say that that's the penalty. Um, and their trap was, all right, if Jesus doesn't follow the law of Moses that's from God, then Jesus clearly can't be from God. He's a fake. He's a yeah. fraud. If Jesus does follow the law of Moses, uh, then this forgiveness, grace, love stuff is just a load of crap, and he's not from God. So the trap that they put Jesus in, I think, is the trap that our culture is putting Jesus in right now. Which one is it, Jesus? Is it God's word or is it God's love? You have to pick. And what he does is he protects the woman, says, I don't condemn you, asks her to follow him, and the capital punishment that she deserves never happens. And if you are a Bible believer, that story should be really unsettling. And for all the Pharisees, they're thinking this story is really unsettling because here is a person who claims to be from God, who claims to be be God, who is not following what the what the Bible says, the penalty for adultery is capital punishment. Well, what they don't know is that in just a few weeks, capital punishment is going to happen yeah, for this adultery. Right. They don't realize that it's not going to be the woman that takes the capital punishment that she does deserve. It's going to be Jesus himself. And the reason Jesus can look at her and say, you're not taking capital punishment, is because in just a few weeks, Jesus is going to hang on the cross. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, yeah. So we just have to remember yeah. that. It's like, man, <laughs> when Romans says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, it's everyone. And... Uh, when, when Jesus, you know, it says when Jesus looks on the, uh, the crowds, he has compassion because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Well, it's like the good shepherd is here, you know? 
And all I want to do with my life is to point people to the Good Shepherd. Because even if someone struggles for the rest of their life, they never clean it up. And I'm probably going to be one of those people. If their heart receives Jesus and turns to Jesus, they will be saved. Yeah. There is not a single person, you know, the Old Testament, if you know the story of the Bible, the Old Testament, this law gets put in place, and basically the point of that law is to show everybody that no one's going to figure out how to follow the law, Yeah, that we need a rescuer. And so Jesus came and was that rescuer. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just, my heart goes out to anyone who is LGBT listening and you just think things are hopeless and and. I'll say to you what I what I say to people all the time is um, the conversation you need to have right now is not about the church or about even about you at all. The conversation you need to have right now is who do you say that Jesus is? If Jesus is who he says he is, he's love, he's compassion, he's a redeemer, he's rescuer, then trust in him first and let him lead you everywhere else. You know, that, let's... Let's not put the cart before the horse. Yeah. Um, if you're listening and, and you're struggling maybe with uh, this conversation, just maybe as someone who believes the Bible or someone who, who doesn't understand, I just need to let you know as a pastor um, that these people, it, they really are accepting Jesus. Mm. You know? I see it all the time. And, and I don't think people... There's many people that are, at, that are at our church, and maybe they don't know this, but you're probably sitting next to somebody that, well, yes, who, very much so. who accepted Christ, and you don't know what that story is. Yeah. And I'm trying to be as patient as Jesus was willing to be patient, uh, which is very, very patient. You know, Peter follows him for three years, and like three years later, Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. it takes them a long time. You know, it's like two and a half years in, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey guys, remember, don't be racist, <laughs> you know? So it's like, Jesus is very patient as people work out their stories, but these people are responding to Jesus. They're responding to Jesus. And just don't let these, these lies from the enemy attack us as Christians that someone is too far from God. Yeah, because they aren't, and uh, and especially in my generation, I, we're seeing that all the time. And then all the generations above us, we're seeing it all the time. But there's some kind of revival happening right now. It's it's huge, and God is God is working. I I want to say um, to everyone uh, a passage that I really love is First Corinthians six. It means a lot to me. And it says this, it says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And then this is my favorite part, verse 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And this is what I would, what I would want to say to all of us. If any of you listening has ever done wrong, Jesus wants to cleanse you. If any of you have ever indulged in sexual sin, you ever looked at porn, you ever gazed at somebody, you ever had an uh, inappropriate thought, uh, you ever had a wet dream, then if you've ever engaged in sexual sin, Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy. If you've ever worshiped an idol, uh, if you've ever chosen to follow anything more than Christ, if you if you are materialistic, if you are um, uh, if if you lack compassion, and you take the abundance God has given you, and buy yourself a toy instead of helping someone in need, if you're more into the title of your job than the the title God has given you as His child, any idol, 
anything that you look to to satisfy in your life, what only Christ can satisfy, I want you to know that Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy if you have committed adultery. And the, Jesus said, if you look um, lustfully at a woman, you have committed adultery. So every man, if you've committed adultery, every woman, if you look lustfully at a man sexually, you've committed adultery. Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy. If you uh, are a male prostitute or you practice homosexuality, Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy. If you're a thief, if you ever cheat the company, if you ever cheat your taxes, if you've ever taken something that's not yours, Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy. If you're greedy, if you would live in abundance while someone else lives with out substance. The Bible, Paul says, I want equality. If they, if you eat, they eat. If you've ever been greedy, Jesus wants to cleanse you and he wants to make you holy. If you've ever been a drunkard, if anything has ever controlled your body besides the Holy Spirit, alcohol, pot, sugar, carbs, you name it, then Jesus wants to cleanse you and make you holy. If you are abusive, if you've used women, if you have been harsh with your children, you've provoked them to anger, if you have used people, then Jesus wants to cleanse you and he wants to make you holy. If you cheat people, he wants to cleanse you and he wants to make you holy. And every single person, I think Paul covered us all. Yeah. Every single person that you sit beside in church was once that. Every single person that you've ever interacted with, and starting with me and starting with yourself, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fill in your sin. But Jesus died once for all. And the wrath of God or the justice of God, he took the death penalty, was poured out on his shoulders so that you could be saved, rescued, freed. And when that happens, you are cleansed, you are made holy, you're made right with God. That means that your penalty for sin was paid. And God is calling you by name to know him and to love him, right? That's the whole story of Jesus right there. And that, that is the gospel or the good news that must be proclaimed. And I don't want you to know half of it. There's a pretty good list of sinners. That's half of it. And the rest of it is there's an amazing God who stepped in and paid for that. And he wants you. You are not rejected by God. You are not rejected by Grace Church. We're all frail and we're all going to mess up. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that every, every sinner, which is every human being, is welcomed and loved. And God wants to deal with our sin. The Bible's crystal clear about that. And he has dealt with it by his grace and mercy. And the Bible is crystal clear about that. And everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Josiah, thanks for having this conversation. Yeah. It's a tough, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it makes me nervous. You know, yeah, I don't want to hurt sure. people, um, but I want to express love. And, and I want all of us to understand that grace and truth go hand in hand. The Bible says Jesus was full of both. Mm -hmm. So he was 100% both those things. You don't have to separate them. Applying grace and truth takes wisdom. It takes leading the Holy Spirit, and, and it, we help each other do that. So this is, this is what I would say. One of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation this way is so that it actually becomes a conversation. Uh, this is not a uh, public statement released by Grace Church. No. This is, this is uh, a couple of pastors wrestling with a fidelity to Scripture and a passion for people, which is 
exactly why we keep talking about Jesus. <laughs> he, he's the one who showed us how to do that. And that's why we want you to know his heart and his mind. So in this format and mixed messages with Jeff Bogue, I know it's funny that I'm Jeff Bogue and I keep saying that, but that's the way you have to search it. Uh, mixed messages with Jeff Bogue. You can feed back. And uh, a lot of what we do on mixed messages is we address your questions and your feedback. So if, if you have questions, if you have specifics, if you have relational scenarios, that it would be helpful for us to walk through, um, and you might think it might be helpful for other people to hear, uh, send those in, and uh, the links are there on the, on the uh, podcast and the, and the site, and, and we'll do our best to engage, engage those things. If we can help you personally, I think something Josiah said that that is um, maybe a revelation to some people is, uh, I know you do, I do. We have these conversations all the, time. all the time. This is not an uncommon conversation. It's not an uncommon struggle. And there are people who, who have a same-sex attraction, uh, who love Jesus and are fighting for purity just like people who have a opposite set uh, 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 sexual attraction love Jesus and are fighting for purity. So it's, it's the same struggle mm -hmm. to love the same God. And any way that we can help with that, come along beside you, answer questions for you, um, we want to do that in, in, in any way we can. So feedback through uh, the Mixed Messages app or the Mixed Messages uh, podcast, and, and we'll continue to have those conversations. Every sinner is welcome at Grace Church. If you're looking for Jesus, you'll fit in just great here. And if you're kind of messed up and a little unstable, you'll fit in perfectly <laughs> at Grace Church. But we would love to know you and love to help you. And we want you to know and understand the love of Jesus. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your grace. And uh, we look forward to keeping the conversation together. Josiah, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.